And is there any any Q and A going on or anything like that? Or uh, no, not not typically. We used to have um, people join us, but we've kind of moved that platform. Like we were very consistent uh, during COVID with them, okay. and it okay. gave like that's where it all started. Like it gave people the opportunity to interact when we were all at home. So that's where that's where it kind of started, and then we've just taken it and due to people's schedules and everybody's back at work that we've kind of just done them like the invites go out if people choose to join cool but if not this full interview gets posted um on our youtube page and then our editor takes bits and pieces for um the podcast okay cool so yeah so welcome everybody i am here with sunny d today He's got such an amazing story. Uh, you know, it started out as a Paul Mitchell graduate, and I think that that just set him up for the success that he's at. He now has five locations. He's written a book. He has a podcast. He's been a platform artist. Like he has just been rocking and rolling and super busy in life. So welcome, Sonny. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Sean. I'm glad to be here and uh, glad to get to connect with your audience. Yeah, so so talk about your journey after you graduated. What was after. what was that like? Uh, scary. Number one, it was very scary because as a person that had never thought about doing hair up until three months before I decided to quit my job and move to Florida to go to Paul Mitchell to school, I I mean I cut my own hair. Um, but when I was in, you know, the classroom, I was I was scared. And when I finished and I graduated and it was time to, like, see if this stuff really works, uh, that's when it got scary for me because I was looking left and looking right. And, you know, I didn't have a, a learning leader. I didn't have an instructor there anymore over my shoulder to check my sectioning to help me with formulation. And so I was I was very, very uh, scared, um, but I was also excited because going into a salon, which is the goal, you know, to go to hair school and then to get a job in a salon. So that was goal number one. And, you know, when I got into the salon, I was just terrified that when I had that first guest, you know, it was going to just be something I'd never even contemplated before. I mean, my highlight up to this point when I graduated from school was getting a round brush stuck in a girl's hair and she almost had to go home with it. That was like my highlight of my career. And of course, my first guest comes in and they've got, you know, hair down to their ankles and I've got to blow dry this hair. So it was it was terrifying. And it, it took probably, you know, a good year, almost more than a year before I kind of got comfortable you know, people say get comfortable in your own skin. It was like getting comfortable in my own scissors and my own color bowl where I would, you know, not second guess myself, a lot of second guessing because it was new. You know, a lot of people I went to school with thought about doing hair when they were little. They knew it. It was like they, you know, was writing on the wall. But for me, it was it was a total different, different experience. And going into the salon was a, you know, was a goal. And when I hit that goal and I got in the salon, uh, then it became real. But um, definitely it was it was terrifying. So at what point did you decide that you wanted to open your own salon and have your first location? So I'm a big believer as an entrepreneur. I don't um, I've never wanted to start a business. You know, I never wanted to go into business. But as an entrepreneur, there's this this I don't know if you want to call it a, a gift or a curse, but we look for you know, problems and to solve problems. And we look for solutions. And I worked for a great salon and I worked for a great mentor and a leader. And uh, he did everything. He had done everything I, you know, thought you could do in the industry as a platform artist, business owner, had a great successful salon. Um, but the thing that really kind of pushed me is in tandem to working in the salon, I was working in the school for whatever reason, I got offered a job in the school when I graduated so I started in the salon on Tuesday, started in the school on Tuesday, and it was my first day at both. I didn't know anything, but I was excited, and Paul Mitchell likes excitement. So I got that offer. So here I am at the school teaching people that literally I just clocked out yesterday. And so I'm in the school, and the school was, at the time here in Tampa, the school was five students, the very first five students that ever went, future professionals in that school, they were, they were my first class. And so they didn't know I didn't know anything. And it was small. We were just doing our thing. But over time, it was about a few years into it, 
I was, you know, hiring people from the school into our salon and it was great, but we ran out of space. And I started getting the school started growing and all the, the school network started blowing up. And I started getting this feeling that, you know, we were losing opportunities because there were so many talented people that we had in the school. And then they were going out into the industry and they weren't really finding, you know, that salon and they couldn't come work with us. We had no room. And so I tried to peer pressure my boss at the time into expanding, open another location. This thing is going to be big. This Paul Mitchell school thing is going to be huge. We're going to open a location in every place there's a Paul Mitchell school, and you're going to be the one to lead the way. And he's, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know. And he'd been doing it so long. He just, he knew what I didn't know. You know, my, my little naivete was, you know, this is easy to do. You know, everybody should do it. Why aren't you doing it? And so I pushed him and pushed him. And it was probably about a good year of pressure in him to do it. And he was just like, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm good. I've got a great salon. And, and I respected that. And I was in school one day. I remember I was in the, in the theater and we just finished up class. And I had two students that week that had come to me. And they told me that they were going to, I think one was going to go to uh, be a dentist and one was going to go to do something else. And they were, you know, I'm talking busy, like they were in school, taking three, four guests at night school and day school, they were rocking and rolling. And I was just like, it's not, this isn't, this isn't right. This is a problem. And at the time we didn't have many options for them. And I understood their frustration. I got lucky to land in the salon that I did. And it was just rebranded and it was Paul Mitchell focus. It was everything that you look for as a graduate. And it just was right there. Um, but there weren't a lot of them. And so that was the problem. We were losing the talent and they were going either to another industry completely, or they were just quitting, or they were just getting discouraged. And some of them would go in a salon and they would just kind of stand around. So you're taking a future professional that was used to seeing three, four guests a day. And now they're in a salon and they're standing around for nine, 10 months and never got to touch hair. And re they were like, you know, I'm, I'm out of here. And so I just had that in my, in my head, in my mind, in my heart. And I was like, you know, I'm telling all of these future professionals about this amazing salon that's out there, but they're not finding it. I know I'm in one, but we can't take them. So we've got to do something. And I was in the theater that day and I made a decision and I left on my lunch break and I went and talked to the owner and I said, you know what? I, I love you. I respect you. I've learned so much from you, but somebody's got to do this. And I was always saying that like, somebody's got to start opening more Paul Mitchell focus on somebody, somebody, somebody. And you look around and one, you know, you turn around, you turn around, there's nobody there. So I'm, then I started thinking, am, am I going to have to do this? And so that was the problem. So I went to him and talked to him. I told him I was going to go, you know, out on my own. And now mind you out on my own, I had no plan really i just had passion i had no finance i had no money i had no location i didn't know where the salon was going to be but i saw the vision i saw a vision of a paul mitchell focus salon that was going to be hiring future professionals coming out of school going to be creating that career path and going to be making good on the promise that i was giving them as a learning leader and so i i just left on lunch and i went and talked to my owner and i said i'm going to go out on my own. I'm going to open a salon. And he was like, yeah, you are. He's like, he knew it. And we hugged it out. And then I go back to the school to finish my day. And I'm like, what the hell did I just do? I'm like, I'm now opening a salon. I have no idea how to open a salon. I know what a salon looks like. I worked in a salon, but I don't know the first thing about business opening anything but i felt that convicted about it i felt that strong about it and i felt like there was a problem that you know i could some maybe have some hand in helping trying to solve and so three years yeah three years into it i i upped and, and went for it now going for it you know is one thing actually getting it is a whole nother thing and it was uh first i tried you know i tried to find a spot couldn't find a spot you know met a couple people had this I had, and here was, here was the, uh, here's how naive I was. I had a lady in the first meeting that I had with her, she had a location and we're talking about potentially doing like some kind of partnership. And at the first meeting, she's like, well, I actually have two salons. 
And I was like, oh, cool. And I was like, well, I have this vision, Paul Mitchell Focus. I work in the school. We have this pipeline of talent coming out. And she gives me the keys to one of the salons in that first meeting and says, yeah, see what you can do with it. She's like, there's only like one person that's working there right now. And I'm like, oh, wow, she really believes in my vision. So I go in there and the little bit of cash that I had, you know, start doing a remodel, you know, start painting the walls and start doing all this stuff and, you know, get everything going. And it was probably about a month later, one of the managers of the property comes and talks to me and says, Hey, you know, I see you here and you're in here working and you're doing stuff and you're starting to teach classes. And I started hiring some people and they're like, are you on the lease? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not on the lease. This is Michelle's salon, but you know, I'm going to be taking over this location. And then he brings up the scary word rent. And I don't know about rent. I mean, I assume that it's, she's got it taken care of. And he's like, well, because she's about 18 months behind in rent. And so that's why I'm asking if you're on the lease, because that's going to be your responsibility. And I was like, I haven't seen a lease. And if that's the case, you haven't seen a lease, you're not on the lease, then either you're going to be liable for the money once you get on the lease, or you need to have a conversation with her. And so that was my first little foray into the big, bad world of business. So needless to say, I vacated the premises, couldn't take the paint off the wall. So the money that I had put in just kind of stayed there and I was back to ground zero. And after that, you know, trying to do another partnership, another lady had this, you had this salon and she's like, yeah, you know, come in. And she felt it. She's like, yeah, the training. And I was telling her about the branding and Paul Mitchell. And we've been around since 1980. And I was telling her all these great things. And so I started doing it again. And I start going and going and going. And right before I went to uh, California for a Paul Mitchell shoot, she says, you know, I just don't know if I want to just be Paul Mitchell focused or if I want to, you know, and she started pulling back and I'm like, well, I've got these people that are kind of lingering and we're starting this whole vision of the salon 1.0, which I told you. And she's like, I don't know. So I go on that trip and come back. And she says, yeah, I'm having second thoughts. So I'm back to ground zero again. And that's when I decided, you know, I'm going to have to try to do this, you know, solo. And that's how I started it solo. And at this point, I have no money. At this point, I'm, I'm barely, you know, hanging on to my bills because I've lost income because I wasn't working in a salon because I didn't have a salon to work in. And I'm on Craigslist and I see a salon. It says turnkey. And turnkey, everything's in there. It's all, it looks great. And the colors that I wanted to brand with, with the black and the white, they were already there. And there was some red splashed in. I loved it. It was already there. And the only catch was turnkey $40,000. And I had no thousand dollars. And so I go and I meet the owner. And at this point, I had my business plan, which was one page, just talking about the vision of these Paul Mitchell focus salons and the training that we're going to provide and creating a career path. So it was a few paragraphs, but that's all I had. And I had a cover sheet and it had a 1.0 on it. And I put it in a binder, you know, and they're like, you want to bind this? It's only two pages. I go into FedEx Kinko's. I'm like, yeah, I just want to make it look professional. And so I go in there and I talk to the guy. And he's listening. And I could tell just how he's like looking at me that, you know, either I'm saying something that he likes, or, you know, he's really, you know, he's, he's listening, he's, he's buying into this vision. And he likes the idea of, you know, he's like, Paul Mitchell, he's like, that, that name is, he's like, I know that name, I want that name on my building. And so then we get down to the money. And I tell him, well, here's the thing. <laughs> I tell him about my couple of stumbles. And I say, you know, I don't, I don't have the 40,000. Is there any other way we can work it out? He's like, well, I would need some kind of like security. And then we came up with a plan where he actually tied in all of the equipment. I mean, down to the staples and the, you know, the pens, it was all itemized as part of the lease. So I never purchased it from him. I leased everything from him and it was all brand new stuff. And it was a business that just happened to, you know, not work out in the area. And it was in a city called Oldsmar. And I'd never even heard of Oldsmar until I found it on Craigslist. And it's right outside of Tampa. And so I get a small security deposit together. 
And at this point, I'm down to like pennies and, and you know, no, no money at all. And I'm like, now I'm at this point where I'm like ready to go all in. So then I step away from the school and this is all I have. And when that happened, I really looked around and I was like, this has to work. And this, there's no other option. There's no other option at all. And I go in there and that was the beginning. And that was in 2008. And we started with, you know, one or two people. And they were people that were right out of school. I had recently just been their instructor. And we kind of grew it from there. Um, the beginning, like any owner, and you owners that are listening to this, you know how it is. You, you know, you do what you got to do. And as an owner, you know, that sounds cool. But then there's all the responsibilities that come with it. And I'm leading people. And I know that I'm maybe not going to be able to make rent this month month because at the same time all the people that i have are right out of school so i'm still trying to teach them how to build a clientele how to have that first guest experience coming up with our operating system which is our bread and butter of how all of our salons operate so no matter which location you're in i thought of it like starbucks no matter where you go if you go in a starbucks you know what you're going to get there's a consistency there so i wanted to really design it even though i had this one flimsy location that was just getting started in my mind I was planning on if I had a thousand of these how would it run mm -hmm. and you don't have a thousand Starbucks without an operating system you don't have a thousand Dunkin Donuts McDonald's whatever you know brand you want to think about you have to have it Paul Mitchell the school same thing and I learned a lot of that from the school with all the you know the manuals and the guides and the systems and the trainings that we have there and so that's kind of how I approached it, even though I had one. And I said, if we're gonna if we're gonna have this table, then it can't be just oh I think this table looks good, and I found it, you know, at a at a yard sale. I mean, I need to see if I can find this table, and it can it be reproduced a thousand times. So I started thinking about it in that bigger kind of picture, and it was it was uh, that that I you know got from watching other businesses, and there weren't a lot of salons. I mean, there are there were chains. But at the higher end, there weren't a lot of like high end chain salons. So really, I don't think there were any that I could look for. So I started looking at other businesses and I was like, how did Starbucks do it? You know, how did McDonald's do it? How did this company do it? How did that company do it? And that's what kind of got me going. And that's what got me in the mindset that if I can do this and get it tuned and fine tuned, then I can do it again. And then I can do it again. And that was kind of the beginning of that journey. Wow. What a, what a great story. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned training quite a bit. And so talk a little bit about the education that you offer within your company. So every month we do training and we have a philosophy. It's ABC, it's art, business, and culture. So we want to train in equal parts. Because what I also discovered in just our industry, you know, we are artists to the core. And sometimes we forget behind that art, there is a business. And if we don't give that business the same attention that we give the art, then we lose it. And with that, you know, we wrap that in culture. We wrap that in the culture that we bring from Paul Mitchell, the school. We wrap that in the culture that we bring in the salon. You know, if you can't come in with a smile on your face, you know, go to sleep with a hanger in your mouth, you know, kind of thing. And so we train on those three things every month. And usually when we get together, you know, we'll have a we'll have a piece of each. So if it's art, you know, we'll maybe work on a haircut, work on a technique, work on a color, work on something in the art, in the art zone. And then we take that, you know, that piece of the training and then we layer it with a business piece. And that's where we get into the numbers. You know, I'm a you know 1.7 GPA. I'm by no means a scholar, but I can do basic math. And when it comes to, you know, being a stylist, knowing your numbers. So we spend time on that. And some owners take the approach that they don't want to show their team or their staff the numbers. I'm like lifting up the hood. I'll show you everything we got because the more it's, it does no service to your team. If, if they don't know the numbers and they don't understand the math and they don't understand why we don't have this product right now because we didn't, you know, look at the bottom line and we didn't look at the margin and, you know, they didn't, if they don't understand that, then they don't know. So we'll spend time on that. 
spend time on the numbers, making sure, especially like your key performance indicators as a stylist, there's really a few that, you know, you need to know, you know, and if you can get even just the basic five key performance indicators, we talk about it in the language. So we talk about services per guest. We talk about, you know, take home bottles per guest. We talk about your average service ticket. We talk about your rebooking percentage and we talk about your new request, new request percentage. And so we'll drill down on those things. And then with culture, you know, that could be as simple as going to the park, you know, having a water balloon fight, just doing something fun, just to kind of bring us together outside of the salon. So a lot of the trainings will happen in the salon. And then we'll take, when we do culture stuff, we'll take it outside the salon. We've done things where we've gone in, you know, in a, in one of those rooms where you put on a suit and you take a bat and you smash something, you know, something like that. We, you know, we've gone a cruise to Cozumel, you know, for top performers and things like that. Those are all good culture builders, but the art, you know, and it's, it can't always be me, you know, as great of an educator, I, I, I try to be, I don't, I, I don't want to listen to me all the time, you know, so we'll look at other educators to bring in and that's where you can network in, in the community. You know, I know people on Instagram, I follow and I see somebody doing an amazing color. I'll reach out to them and say, Hey, would you come share a technique with my team? You know, spend an hour with my team. So I can kind of mix that up, but it has to be it, there. There can't be any compromise on it. It has to be continuous, has to be ongoing. Um, and it has to build. And so we look at that in each each quarter, we kind of lay out what the art piece is going to be. So if this month is haircutting, next month is color, next month is styling, and then the same thing with business. And it may be this month, we're just going to focus on one of the KPIs, just on rebooking percentage and finding out, you know, who has their, you know, the highest average ticket or doing a contest or something on along those lines. But I always try to look at training in those three components, art, business, and culture and just continuous, continuous. And everybody's coming out of school. Everybody's in the salon right now. There's not a person that doesn't want more education. So there mm -hmm. can never really be enough. So we try to keep it consistent. Absolutely. So now that you've gone from your one location and now you have five locations, how are you, how are you leading five locations? Um, really, I mean, I'm empowering really more than leading. I, I call it more of an empowerment because you have to have, especially, so the, the first one, you know, it's, it's going right. It's your baby. You're there. And then when you do that second one, like we went downtown Tampa and that's, you know, only 20 minutes away. So I could spend half a day in one and half a day in the other. And then you go for a third one. That's now two hours away. Well, maybe I can spend three hours here. And so you first, you try to be everywhere all at the same time, which is impossible. And then you go into another state when we went to Texas a few years back, then I'm like, well, I definitely can't be <laughs> here and there at the same time. And I do the best I can. I just flew in last night from Dallas. Um, so I do get to spend time in all of them, but it's really about empowering <clears throat> and you develop those, those leaders within, you know, then some people want it. Some people don't. I've, I've definitely tried to put square pegs in, in round holes before, and you see somebody and they're, they're just so good. And you're like, you're going to be a leader. And they're like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and they just don't want any part of it. They want to come, they want to do hair. They want to, you know, enjoy the trainings, but just empowering. And I look for different things in people, how they interact with their guests, how they interact with each other. And so that's the only way that I found that it can work because I've tried to be everywhere all at once and you can't, it's just impossible. And so just trying to empower people that are in the salon, you know, and given, and also giving them the tools. And one of the things that I would say is if your salon can run without you there, don't let your ego get bruised. That's a good sign. Because if it only works when you're there, then it actually doesn't work. And so looking at that system and taking those leaders on a journey, taking those leaders in the training. So we develop the leadership training for them is really them learning the system inside and out. You know, that one page is now turned into a hundred page manual. Um, we have a leadership guide as well. So it's grown over, over the years, but they're now learning the system. So they could, in, in a sense, they could then operate that salon, that location as if it were their own. And when you, when you do that, and you may also actually make it part of their own. You could think about that. If you start giving people ownership in the company, you know, that's a, that's a big step. And I know you've had some experience with that and that's, you know, it's, it's a way that 
you know, you're actually giving, you know, saying thanks and you're giving acknowledgement to that person, but developing those leaders and then having those leaders, you know, learn the system and then having those leaders be able to teach it. And that's really what I've done. And that's what's been working um, for us as a company, but you find them within, you find them within. I've never like put out, you know, Hey, looking for a salon manager. It's always, and, and we don't really even use the, the term manager. It's more like leaders. And we have our leaders within the company. And some people may lead one department, you know, maybe they're, you know, a barber and they're going to lead the barbers and maybe they're a haircutter. They're going to lead the haircutters. Or maybe they're just good at seeing, you know, that that 30,000 foot view and they can kind of see the whole field. And then you have somebody that you're looking at may become a director. So now they're directing traffic, they're directing business, they're directing guests. And they have to be able to balance that because sometimes they want to stay behind the chair. But I know when I'm working behind the chair, which I still do, then I'm not running the business. I'm working with my guests and vice versa. When I'm running the business, you know, then I'm not behind the chair. So you find that balance to where you can, you know, find people that want to play in, in both fields. And, but really it's about developing them from within. And that's, that's what I've done. And, you know, some, some, some are good and some are, you know, better and some just aren't. And, you know, it's, it's trial. It's not a perfect science. No, absolutely. So the last thing that I want to really just hit, <clears throat> hit on is that you wrote a book. I did. So talk, talk about your book because your book is available at Palm Matula School, Fort Myers. We do have it. So if you're interested, they are there. Um, yes, so talk yes. a little bit about it. So, and so I've got, an, I've got a copy of it here. Um, so here's, here's what happens. I'm a 1.7 GPA. I barely ever read a book, right? And I'm like, oh, I've got some nerve. I'm going to write a book. So definitely when you go through here, you know, there's typos, try to, try to get over that because the message is there. Uh, the reason that I wrote it is as I was going through that journey and like I was telling you coming out of school and being nervous and being scared that first year, it's, it's almost like a, a little GPS, it's almost like a guide. And if you look at some of the chapters, it kind of starts, you know, starts off with that, you know, that introduction of now you're in the salon. Why? Why are you here? Why are you in the industry? You know, because I found that my why, the bigger and stronger my why is, it, it keeps you engaged. I'm looking at things that I think don't really matter as much. I know I've never looked at anyone's resume that I've ever hired. Um, because the resume, it's all about a rear view mirror, how cool I used to be. Remember back in November to February, I worked at this one store. I was amazing. And that does it as an owner. That doesn't really do anything for me. I need to know where you're going. And so this is kind of speaking on that. It speaks to that, that next generation um, interviews, how to interview a salon owner. I've had people sit down with me and never ask me a single question. And so these were these are things that I started to notice as I started to build the company and I started hiring people that were missing. You know, the hustle muscle, you know, building a clientele, those numbers that I talked about, there's that whole chapter on there. Uh, mentors and coaches, two different people. There's one on, you know, a whole chapter on that. And then it gets into all of those things that I know I didn't really have and, you know, at the at the you know, at my fingertips. And I noticed that a lot of other stylists that were coming in weren't really prepared with some of those things. So it's not going to be about a haircut. It's not going to be about a technique. It's going to be more about that business and navigating that first, you know, 12 to 18 months. And so if you have, if you pick up one or two things out of there and you're able to, you know, be more successful in finding the salon that you want, having a little bit more insight on your business, realizing how to create the resume of the future, which is a, a whole separate, you know, we, we could do a whole separate class. And I've done that on what I would do if I started over again, I talk about how I would create the resume of the future to give that owner that, that windshield view, not the rear view mirror view. Mm -hmm. And in this, in that, that same time, you know, you're going through that first year. Um, then recently, you know, I was like looking at the same thing as I started to talk to owners and I don't know if you guys have this one, but, you know, because I was so, you know, happy with all of my writing abilities, I decided to write your first year in salon ownership. So that's a newer one. And so that's awesome. going to speak to the owners and that's going to talk about, you know, how did I, you know, start as, how do you, I start a salon? I have no money. What if I'm thinking about expanding? 
What if I'm looking at the systems? How do I put that system and go from one page to a hundred page manual? Um, looking at the hiring process, career paths, um, talks a lot about that. You only have two hands, so you can't do everything. The growth and expansion plans. So it touches on the things that I picked up, you know, and I didn't, you know, write this book until I was about almost 10 years as a salon owner. And then I started looking at it because it's the same thing. You're going to have a first year in ownership and it's going to, it's going to hit you just like your first year in the beauty industry hits you. And they're equally, I mean, maybe one's harder than the other, but those are just things that I learned. If I was going to be a new owner, or if I was thinking about being an owner, even if it's a one chair salon or a studio, these are things that I put in there for those first year owners. So you got your first year beauty professional coming out of school, and then you have your first year owners. I might do another one too. I don't know. I'm feeling, I'm feeling a little good. We'll see. <laughs> Got to awesome. learn how to use spell check though. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So we'll definitely have to get some copies of that for sure. So final, final message that you want to give out there to the salon leaders. Okay. Final message. So what I would say, you know, I think about the salons and the landscape, especially over the last like couple of years, we've, we've gone through a lot of changes, you know, and, and some people are getting upset. You know, some people are, this isn't fair, you know, wh whether the economy is up or down, all of these things. And then COVID comes along and how does a hairdresser do hair through zoom? They don't, you know, and so just know that this isn't the first time it's a cycle. This isn't the last and as you're leading, you are the beacon, you know, you are that light, people are looking to you. And I think during the challenging times, that's when you as a leader really need to rise up. And you need to almost, you, you got to kick it into another gear as a leader of people. You know, they're trusting in us. They're trusting in us to guide them, to take them to the promised land, whatever that looks like. And so if you're a leader out there, you're, you know, an, an owner, a manager, whatever we want to call it, just know that this is your time because the challenging times are the times when, you know, it, it kind of separates the, the leaders from the, it, I, it'd be cool to be a leader, but this is really going to separate, you know, the real from the, the, the fake. So when you look at your people, know that they're trusting in you and you don't have to be right on every move. You don't, you don't have to be right in every decision, but one thing that you need to be is you need to be convicted. Mm -hmm. So whether, whether you're marching people into a wall, you better march them into that wall with pride and with, with power and with determination, even though you're going to hit that wall and everyone's going to get their nose broken, you still march them in that direction with the same amount of conviction you would do anything. And people are looking for that. They're looking for leadership. They're looking for guidance. And so I think right now is, is our time as, as leaders, as salon owners, as managers to really, we can have a bigger impact than any. Everyone's great. Everyone could be a great leader when things are great, but when they're not, that's when we really have to rise up. So just keep that in mind. This is our time. Perfect message. Thank you, Sonny. Awesome. Thank you guys. Good luck and reach out to me. Any questions or anything? And I look forward to chatting with you guys again soon. Awesome. Have a great day. All right. You too, Sean. Good talking to you. You too.